Thanks to us for our campaign with the confidence rising. I told WDF don't switch good times are coming on EFD diving. Fan cams, reactions, watch along, still the pride of London thriving. The Eagles of South they flying. Keep your eyes on us, we ain't hiding. Yes, guys, how's it going? Welcome back to Eagle Eyed Football. Uh, today's show is Tap Eagle for our game against West Ham. We are doing this show an hour early, uh, purely because there's Champions League tonight. And whenever we do it at 8 o'clock, which clashes with the Champions League, no one seems to turn up. So I thought, so Dan had the good idea of thinking, oh, let's go live earlier. Oh, yeah. oh that, that, was, that was Rich's idea. I can't, I can't steal that one. But I think as well, like the games tonight, I don't know. I don't know if we could, we, we, we struggled to compete at the best of times. And I think the two games on tonight, that would just be, that would slaughter us. Yeah. The, the only person to tune in would be Chairman. <laughs> <laughs> Big up, Chairman. <laughs> yeah, of course. But guys, thank you for joining us. Um, I'm not. This is a bit of a weird game now because, in a sense, I feel like that Liverpool win secures our safety. But now it really shows what Glasner's all about. Do we go on the beach and prepare for next season, or is it a case of all right now we push on? Um, it's a, it's a weird one because, um, I think. I do. Uh, ideally, I would like another win at some point in the season, or or a few draws, just to really make sure. Um, I mean, to be honest, I was pretty confident that we would stay up anyway before that. Um, but nevertheless, I think I think we should push on because um, obviously we want to end end the uh, season on a high. And I think the fact that we've got a new manager as well is is extremely important with that. Because the players, I feel like, you know, they've got something to prove going into going into the summer where they are talking about a big overall. They have actually got investment as well. So they are intending to, to spend money. And obviously, we are probably going to see one or two players go for pretty big money as well. So there will definitely be money in the bank. Um, you know, if you're like a Jeffrey Schlupp or a Jero Riedewald or like a Joel Ward or someone like that, I think you really are playing... To, to be in that team and or, or at least should be. And if they're not, then that just kind of solves the problem for us of mm-hmm. maybe move them on. I think also, um, I think I'd only do this when we are mathematically safe. But in that case, Glasner is also a manager to trust in the youth and try and implement more youth players. So when we're mathematically safe, I wouldn't be surprised if you see Glasner still, got, still putting in some some of the youth players, and they're going to be hungry to impress. So, you know, I think that Glasner, as a coach, his mentality is to, is to keep pushing on because at the end of the day, I think even if you finish one place higher in the Premier League, I think it's an extra £5 million on your on your money for next year. So there's always incentive to move up the table, even if it is this late in the day. Yeah, no, absolutely. You yeah, could see Murfarin get a few minutes because he's been on the bench. But think he never came on, but you know he could come yeah. on, for example. I think he scored. Um, um yeah, he scored against uh, Everton yesterday in the Under Twenty Ones International mm-hmm. Cup Final as well. Oh, also, Cup Final, sorry. Um, in I think in the final, they're playing PSV again, aren't they? So that certain goalkeeper Dan, you can go and go give him a piece of your mind again if you want. Well, to. uh. I think he's probably not a child anymore. He probably doesn't play for the under twenty ones. <laughs> well, for for the people that don't know, is Dan is a a certain man that doesn't get rattled very often. However, there was this one time when we went to the last final, he was fully tilted by some under twenty one goalkeeper. <laughs> <laughs> it was funny. <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't know what it was. He he he, he just rattled me. He, just, he didn't even do something like that <laughs> rattling either. I think, I think I just had to get all my axed out. He just pushed your buttons, mate. He just... Yeah, I think so. I think so. Anyway, we are going off track. This is West Ham Palace, not the not not gas up the youth. Um, let's let's go let's go into the uh, the predicted eleven, which is a bit tricky, if I'm honest.
quick change. Fucking hell, mate. You got the Velcro if you took it <laughs> straight off. <laughs> <laughs> um, as always, with um, when we talk about predicted 11s, we do always run through the injuries first. So uh, we have, so for us, still injured is Sam Johnstone, Chet DeCure, uh, Rob Holding, uh, Chris Richards is out until the game after this game. Same with Jez. And Matthias Franza is an unknown injury. But I think we all know why he got that injury. But, you know, not saying too much. <laughs> uh, anyway, moving to West Ham. Uh, Mavropanos should be back for our game. Jared Bowen is available for the Leverkusen game. So he'll be available for our game. Same with Phillips. Same with Ariola. So, essentially... West Ham are going to have a fully fit squad by the time they get to play us. Which is great. Yeah. That's fr- as frustrating because when I looked yesterday to do, do my research, it had it still had Jared Bowen as being out. Mm-hmm. And JC told me today that he wasn't actually, in fact, out. And it kind of ruined my evening a little bit. Mm-hmm. Well, I ruined your evening about five minutes ago. So, <laughs> uh, here is what I've gone with for the combined eleven. Uh, not combined eleven, the predicted eleven. So, for us, I've gone with the same team that we started against Liverpool. If it's not broken, don't change it. That's my philosophy, basically. So, Henderson, Lerma, Anderson, Klein at the back, with Mitchell Munoz as the wing backs, Hughes, Wharton as the double in midfield, with JP. Michael Elise and Eze up front. Dan, are you changing anything against West Ham? No. Um, the only thing I might do is possibly swap Klein for a ward just because I think a bit more high a bit, bit, yeah, yeah, just a bit, bit better in the air, and that's that's the only reason to be honest. Mm-hmm. Um then we go to West Ham. Now I'm very confused because I'm not sure because they are two 0 down against Leverkusen in the Europa League, so it's not it's not a it's not a score line that is impossible to come back from. But I'm not sure if they're going to gamble that basically, but I do have a feeling that they are high enough in the Premier League that they might actually gamble on it. So here is very tough for me to pick who to play. So what I've done is I've sort of like picked and chosen certain players that might actually take a rest in the Leverkusen game, but then they'll play against us because I think they're playing t- was it two games in three days. Yeah, so it's, it's something well, like that. Well, I'll play Thursday and then we'll play again on Sunday. Yeah. So, for example, as you can see, I've got Paqueta, Emerson, Alvarez, Aguard, and Danny Ings all on the bench because I expect those guys to play in the champion and uh, not in the Champions League in the Europa League. So for example, I've gone f- for their team. They do a play they play a 4231 formation. We've gone with Fabianski, Cresswell, Zuma, Mavropanos, Kufau at the back with Phillips, Suchek and War Prowse in the midfield with Kudus, Antonio and Jared Bowen up front. Dan, I'm sure that you've got different ideas of what they're doing. Yeah, I mean, I think the, I think one thing I did notice with West Ham is that they've actually got very decent depth. Like, they really yeah. use that Declan Rice money very well. Like, in that midfield, you could quite easily have Alvarez in there. Um, yeah, you, like, you could have Paqueta in there, Alvarez in there. Yeah, and then left-back as well, Emerson could very well be there. Uh, Ings is always a de- is obviously a we know is a very good finisher. He they've even, they've even been top. playing um, Antonio on the wing sometimes lately as well. Yeah, exactly. And I think, like I say, I think I think their European game is a very big complicating factor. Obviously, depending on what happens and whether they go for it, so it could be any one of those those uh, those players really. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm. To be fair, it's it's it is a guess, isn't it? You don't you don't know what they're gonna do tomorrow. I'm sure if you if you get an idea of what they're gonna do tomorrow, you've probably got more of an idea of what they'll do against us. But yeah, no, hundred percent. I would say for um I guess to help us out in this episode, 
should we stick with this 11 or do you want to change one or two players maybe just to make it a little bit easier so I talk about the same team? Um, it, it doesn't really matter to me because it, the, the premise will still be relatively similar as well. Amari in my mug. Um, have you uh, a little bit off topic? But have you seen that um, that West Ham fan that had his stag do? He dressed no. up as a, he, he dressed up as a cat, and all his mates had West Ham kits on with Zuma on the back, chasing him around the city <laughs> center. I thought that I thought that was a uh, I thought that was a, that, that was a very good one. If That's I brilliant. I, I enjoyed that. There was there was another there was another fancy dress I saw the other day. I think it was for the Grand National, and um, someone dressed up. You know that meme of the. Of the rate guy in the Rangers shirt, but he's he, they photoshopped a dog on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he went when is that? He had like a dog, pathetic dog head in a <laughs> in an old Rangers shirt. Yeah, that's great. That's that is great. Um, so uh, this week, uh, I am doing how we can attack West Ham, and you're doing how we can defend against West Ham. Correct. Yeah. Would you like to go first, or should I? I'm easy. I don't mind. Uh, I'll go first. I think you went. For, I think you went first last week, so I'll go first yeah. this week. All right. Let's get into how we can potentially beat West Ham. All right. So, how do we beat West Ham? So, certain things we have to know about West Ham. I have got a notes, so if you are wondering why I'm looking down, I'll read them from my notes. Uh, certain things that West Ham do. Let's get this tactics board ready to go. So, when they do a certain thing called defending, which uh, as a David Moyes team, they like to do very much. They sit back, normally, but the main thing is that they are very, very, very narrow when they defend. Okay, so they sort of defend like this. They always want their wide men out wide and semi-pushed up because when they do get the ball, most of the time it is route one straight to the other end of the pitch. Let me get a ball. So, for example, if we got the ball here and he gets dispossessed by Zuma... He'll pass it to Mavropanos. I'm, I'm sure Dan will talk about this pre a lot more than me. But these guys will run and there'll be a hoof and then we need to not commit ourselves too much, too far forward so we don't get a counter-attack done on us. But I'm sure Dan will talk about that a hell of a lot more than what I've just said there. So, obviously, we need to attack. We need to be very quick about our attack, but we can't commit too much forwards. So, in a way, we sort of need to play very similarly to our game against Liverpool here. Um, what One thing that they do like to do when defending, so for example, if Eze's got the ball here, their full-backs are very aggressive with their challenges. They will step out of line. So, for example, you see the back four line here is very clear. The full-backs will very quickly step out. So, if Eze's got the ball, it'll definitely close down with a lot of intensity there. So that leaves two things that could happen. One, Eze has a brain fart and just lets Kufal clatter him and then gets the ball away from him. Or, if Eze is smart, if he's committing himself so far forwards, Eze could do a nice piece of skill and work his way around him and then have a lot of empty space to run into, for example. Um, similarly to... Um, most other teams actually in the Premier League. Uh, most of their centre backs are actually very slow. So Aguerd, not the fast guy in the world. Mavropanos, not the fast guy in the world. Ogbonna's dreadfully slow. Uh, the only one I would say is not slow is Zuma. And I think Zuma's going to be the main guy here because for me, whenever I've seen West Ham play against us, when I've ever seen. Kurt Zuma play against us, even when he was at Everton, he's always had a good game against us. And for me, I think he's a very, very, very underrated centre back in the league. Um, I think there was a, a tweet from a Spurs fan saying um, he rated all the 
um, centre backs in the Premier League or something like that in like a yeah, I saw that yeah. Um, he put Lewis Dunk in E when Lewis Dunk should have been in G, but G actually had Kurt Zuma in it, and I thought that's harsh. That's really harsh because I think he's he's. I wouldn't say is he. I think he's one of the better centre backs outside of the top six, in my opinion. Um. But yeah, so other things. Mavropanos, not the best in the air. Uh, Aguerd, not the best in the air. Obon was tall, but he's still not the best in the air, but Kurt Zuma is. So this is basically the route I'm going at. Kurt Zuma can do a lot of good things at the back. And he can do a lot of good things better than a certain Mavropanos. So what I'm trying to get at here. Is if Mateta's trying to stand one of them, um, stand one of them up, so go one on one with a certain centre back, I would suggest that Mateta drifts over to Mavropanos or whoever's playing alongside Kurt Zuma because I I feel like Mateta can overpower this guy. Where I feel like Mateta might still be able to overpower Zuma, but it'll be a lot more work for him. And I feel like Mateta will get a lot better hold-up play, a lot more ball, a lot more link-up play if he does try and go for the weaker opponent, which is something I feel like our strikers need to do a little bit more because I thought that sometimes um, Mateta was actually going 1v1 against Van Dijk. Like, I know he beat him sometimes, but most of the time Van Dijk just took the ball off and the pass through. So I feel like Mateta needs to be a little bit smart in those kind of situations. Um one thing I was a bit surprised about with um, uh, David Moyes and his very defensive style of football is that on average, throughout the whole season, they concede 1.7 goals per game. Really? Yep. Wow, that's really high. <laughs> that's a lot higher than I thought. Yeah. Um, for a team that is known last season um, with David with David Moyes to be a team that scores loads of set pieces. Um, they've only scored seven goals from set pieces so far this season, even though they've scored 58 goals total. And actually, they've conceded more goals from set pieces than us this season. They've conceded eight goals from set really? pieces this season. Are they really? Yes. Wow, that shocks me. And that's one thing that I thought I am very surprised about that because I would, surprised expect, about that, yeah. I would have never expected it. That's crazy. And then in my in my research as well, I thought, who did they play in the um, in the Europa League? They played against Leverkusen. And you're thinking, hold on, you're going a bit mad here. There's no similarities between Crystal Palace and Leverkusen. You are <laughs> wrong, actually, because a certain Xavi Alonso, I wouldn't say that he's stolen Oliver Glasner's formation or tactics, but he plays a very similar style of football to Oliver Glasner, as he plays the same style of uh, free at the back with really wide wing backs, with very good ball playing midfielders and a very prominent strike force. And granted, we don't have the players on the same level as Leverkusen, but we still play in a similar way. And what did Leverkusen do to beat West Ham? Well, they scored two corners, first of all. Granted, they have Boniface, who's a beast up, up front for them. But both of the headers that... I think both of the corners that were scored, they were both... I get either three headers or just a complete mess in the box, which was just slotted in the goal. Yeah. So, actually, attacking set pieces here might be the play because Glass has already tried to introduce new corner routines, uh, different people taking set pieces. Like um, against Liverpool, as they whip one in, instead of Anderson getting up and cr and going straight for goal, he headed it back across for Mateta to shoot. So. Granted, it's still very basic. It's still something different that we haven't done before because under Roy, let's say, Anderson would have just shot straight away. Or even something that we have seen before is Eze tries shooting from a ridiculous distance because we have seen that before as well, haven't we? Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, they play similar to Palace 
and they scored two set pieces. Granted, I know we don't score many set pieces and we haven't even scored a corner yet this season, which is still crazy to me. <laughs> set pieces, I feel like, is the way to go. Mateta has been pretty good in the air, so why not? Yeah. Um, another thing that Leverkusen did to really trouble Fabianski is potentially Fabianski's age might be catching up to him a little bit because they had a shoot on site mentality. They had 33 shots, and I think they had 13 on target, I believe it was. Uh, I know I know it was 33 shots, definitely. Uh, but yeah, 33 shots, 13 on target. Mm -hmm. And basically, that means that Fabianski was a very, very busy boy in that goalkeeper, in that, in that net. And most, and I think five or six of those shots were back to back to back to back. It dropped, they shot, he saved. It dropped, they shot, he saved. So, and then eventually they got the ball in the net because he just kept having so many shots that he was just too busy. And the reason why he conceded is because he just, I don't know whether he got tired or what, but the ball sort of rolled into the far corner of the net and he just didn't even die for it. It looked like he mm -hmm. was just, just tired. Um, because of how narrow West Ham play, the wing backs were crucial in this game for Leverkusen. Granted, they don't have Mitchell, they've got Grimaldo, they don't have Munoz, they've got Frimpong. But still, because of how tight they are, and remember, the fullback steps out very quickly. If the fullbacks or if our fullbacks already overlapped and the, and this one has already stepped out, a simple pass here, you've got so much space to run into. And to be fair, from what we've seen from Munoz, he's very happy to dribble into the box here. Mateta does a nice little near post run, nice little tap in there. So that is ways that they definitely hurt them. Um, mm -hmm. Leverkusen did. Did um did the wingers not help out the fullbacks at all? Not really, um, because they did. They played what they played was they played something very different. So they had, I think, Kudus was over here. Bowen was still injured. Danny Ings up top, and Antonio was on the was on the left. Right. And granted, Antonio started his career as a fullback, but when um oh, who was it? I can't remember what their what their right winger was, but. I think he done a few. It was a, there was a few instances where he picked up the ball. He stood up, Antonio took a touch round him. Antonio followed him f f to like here, and then the second that they ran past this point, and Cresswell, uh, not Cresswell, and Emerson stepped out. Antonio backed off and tried to make a and like, tried to make himself available to run onto. So he made it go from a two on one to a one on one very quickly, mm -hmm. but because of that reason. The fullback was out wide. Then it became a two-on-one in Leverkusen's favour, for example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, whether it be a poor game management or what from Antonio, that just wasn't the right call there. But if that's something that David Moyes has asked him to do, then I guess that's a tactical error on his part. Um, obviously, with Leverkusen dominating the ball in midfield. And that's something we did against Liverpool. Even though they had, even though Lever um, even though West Ham had a three-man midfield, the two-man midfield of Shaka and Wurtz, I think it is. Yeah. Very so one of them's a very good breakup of play, and the other one is very technically gifted. And I wouldn't say Walton's as good as Wurtz, and I wouldn't say that he's as good as Shaka at the moment. But it's still very similar profile of player here can pick a good pass, can break up play. And they dominated the midfield of these guys. And these guys actually had their full-strength midfield out as well. Mm -hmm. um, finally, just strong dribblers. Like, Frimpong caused loads of issues down this side. Grimaldo caused loads of issues on, down this side. Wurtz dribbling inside, ghosting in behind. They just can't deal with dribblers. Every time they tried to tackle Wurtz, it was a free kick from outside the box. It was mayhem for them to try and get through. So, how does Crystal Palace beat them? Uh, you beat them by playing their own game. And what I mean by that is you try and get from back to front with the least passes possible, let's say. 
So they're not a very high pressing team. So let me move uh, these guys back again. They're not a very high pressing team. Uh, what we talked about um, against Liverpool, this is their wingers basically do what Salah does. They'll Salah will cut off the passing lanes here, but if the ball's here, he won't make that dart and run straight for Klein. He'll sort of stand here, mark off this space. Antonio would sort of mark off this space, and then maybe Bowen would sort of be pushed up in this area to try and stop the passes to these three. But because of how narrow they defend, a nice and easy switch could leave loads of space down the side. And Mitchell's actually been very good um, on the ball against Liverpool, for example. So I, after that game, I wouldn't be surprised if he could pick up the ball here and actually dribble forwards. <coughs> uh, getting in behind as well is definitely something that can happen. Let me move back here. So I know Dan's going to talk about the defending, but with what I said about them, they are very route one down straight down the other end. Because of how they play, they need to commit players forwards to allow them to win the ball up top, drop the ball down and maybe have a shot, similar to what Sean Dyche does with Everton. But if you can intercept that ball, you leave a lot of their players out of position because Kufal, very similarly to Trent, will run up. Cresswell has got, a, has got a tendency to run up. More Emerson. Um, Emerson does like to do the full overlap, but Cresswell will stand up high because he's got a very good left-footed cross. And really just, if we overload and get in behind, it's a very good way of defeating them. Um, I think when... Who was it? When we, when we beat them at their place... No, was it a draw with Conor Gallagher when he scored twice? The reason no, why we, we lost, we no, I saw we drew right. It was two two. What us against Chelsea? No, us against West Ham. Oh, Pan. sorry. Oh, I thought you meant no, no. I thought you meant when when you moved. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. The reason why we got in that situation to cut it back is because we sent a ball over the top. Zaha ran onto it and cut it in behind, because they're so bad at defending. Looking at their own goal. Um, something that I think we should redo, that I think we've done very well, and I know that we spoke about it against Liverpool, is standing goal side of their fullbacks. We've done it so well against Liverpool, I don't see a reason to stop it. Granted, Cresswell does tuck in, so it will be less likely to happen on this side of the pitch. However, with Kufal, it happens quite a lot, and I've got some images that will back that up as well. Uh, Yeah. So just to recap, JP don't stand on Zuma. Uh, da, 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 da. Rotation for Europe. Also, when they're running back on goal, remember I said that the the, the centre backs are very slow. So are the midfielders. They don't really track back. We've seen it from Calvin Phillips. Bro, Bro's got sent off twice, and he's only been there for four months. He's useless. However, because we were going to get him, I, gra I guarantee you that if he plays, he'll have the the best game of his life. But from what I've seen of, with him, he's been useless. And actually, I think that Antonio and Kudus have both been missing quite a few chances lately. So maybe those two are actually a little bit, maybe even low on confidence at the moment. Because I think Kudus had a chance where he was, took a touch in the box against Leverkusen and snatched at it. Where in the Premier League, when he was scoring goals for fun, he was very composed. But that sort of seemed to go a little bit lately mm -hmm. uh, let me get into here uh, where am I yes so <clears throat> this is their game against Fulham uh, to be fair I didn't actually have to go too far back to get the so to illustrate what I said you just have to look at just the Fulham game in its own, because both of the goals that they scored implement both of the ways that I think that we should try and get at them. So, for example, 19 is Munez, or Mun Munez. How do you say his name, Dan? You're Brazilian. I'm not Brazilian. Uh, yeah, you are. <laughs> mu 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 I don't know, mu Munez? So, Munez is the 19. Mavropanos, the guy who said um, is not too good in the air, 
is here. Aguered pushed up to try and get the ball, but the ball got laid off out wide. So Aguered out of position. Emerson done the same thing, pushed out, out of position. So the battle here is Alex Awobi is, of course, looking for that ball into Moon is here. And obviously, Mavropanos is in a good place. However, a certain coup foul is pushed up a little bit too high. Let's say. Let's go to the next frame. Moon is drops out wide. So obviously, he's in front of, um, of Kufal. He's got a lot of space running into the box. But look, Mavropanos, he's got to the ball first, you know. You know, he's, he's, he's in the ball's in the air. He should have a good touch. He's a Premier League player. What's he going to do after that touch? The touch loops out. <laughs> and because these guys are so out of position, Pereira could pass to Muniz for a free goal, or he could do what he did, and he takes a touch and just slots it in an open goal himself. So mm -hmm. that is one where the defenders charge out. If they miss the ball, they are really in trouble also these guys and when he scores these guys end up running into each other which is quite hilarious to see a goalkeeper <laughs> and a center back run into each other in their own box here so robinson is off the off the pitch he's basically played a ball in round the side this is willian running and he's standing goal side of a certain kufal kufal's not the fastest guy in the world he's really not but he loves to stand up high because he is good going forwards because he nearly scored in 30 seconds in this game. However, when it comes to him doing defensive work, he's not the best. He's out of position. Mm -hmm. Like, look, these, these guys are sort of... like They're doing what they need to do. He's making sure that if, if he gets out there, he can cut across. He's covering his man, and he's aware of his man behind him. And just to show you the extent, because Willian... He's old, but he's not slow, but he's not the fast guy in the world. Look at the amount of space he's then got down the wing. Imagine this being Eze. Imagine this being Elise. Imagine this being both of them linking up. A 2v2 of Eze and Elise versus these two. It's, it's a long day for the, for the West Ham defenders. And what does Willian do? Stands them up, waits for their runners... Remember what I said? Midfielders, very slow at getting back. Wall prowls, nowhere. Their DM, Alvarez, he's even behind the referee. Phillips, no man's land. Granted, Pereira runs onto the ball and he hits it wide, but still, it's another chance that came from a very, very, very simple move from Fulham. Mm -hmm. Okay. So see, it seems like we've got some uh, potential ways to... To score against them, then it's good. Mm -hmm. uh, any questions that you have, or no? I think I think yeah, no, that covered all the bases. Um, yeah, hopefully we can. Hopefully, well, I mean, usually we're pretty spot on with uh, if any goals get scored. Uh, so hopefully, yeah. hopefully you'll be spot on again. <laughs> well, yeah. So I guess the the main ones is overlapping fullbacks, getting in behind. Standing goal side of their um, of their fullbacks, uh, making them, I guess, commit a little bit too much in the back line and having a little bit of individual skill. I'd say that's probably the ways I would reckon us to score. Because even though set pieces are a big thing against them, we're so bad at them. I'm just going to discount that altogether. Fair but now I've said that we're going to score a corner. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, let's, let's hit some comments before we go into Dan's segment. So, big up Luke. He's saying 2 1 Palace. Mateta winner. I hope so. Really think we can win this one. Not too sure about the clean sheet. Uh, <clears throat> big up Chairman. Still smiling about Sunday. I think we oh, all too. are. I think I've watched that goal about 10 times by now. Uh, Mitch saying skipping this game is going to go support the women's team. Nice. They're doing very well at the moment. Doing very well. Going to be a good end to the season. Uh, did West Ham away anyway. Still waiting for Glasner Cam or access all over from Liverpool. Uh, Luke's hoping for you to get your revenge, but he might not be a kid anymore. <laughs> uh, da -da -da, certain meow. Uh, <laughs> Zoom will be quick to chase JP Cateto. Cateto. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, that was terrible. Come on, Chairman. Yeah, that's a Dan joke. That's actually worse than a Dan joke. <laughs> that is. <laughs> uh, spiritual here saying West Ham is easy work. I wouldn't say that at all. Uh, even in Animal, big up Monty. I want Wharton to score. I think he deserves a goal, really. He yeah, had a few. Awesome. He had a good shot against Liverpool, actually, didn't he? Uh, he got yeah, blocked. He did. Uh, Wharton's been outstanding. Uh, do you have any updates on the injuries? Basically, no one's going to be back until the next game, but the but the only two that come back next game is Richards and Jez. So, no one really, no one really starting for us. Yeah, uh, Jez played last were... night as well. He, he got taken off at half time, though, didn't he? I did it, I fair. Yeah, uh, well, it was better than when he got when he started last time, isn't it? Because he got injured after twenty minutes, just like at least they did. Yeah, true. Um, Big clubs are watching Wharton. Yeah, he's he's going straight to the top. I think I actually agree with you now, Dan. I think he's got a higher ceiling than Michael. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I, 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 yeah. I think I think he's awesome. Like it, when I start, because I first started watching him like September, and we're at Blackburn, and I was just blown away. Spiritual said four 0 Palace, and finally the dog saying, very confident for Sunday, should be there. Uh, but we love Malcolm. You always do. <laughs> uh, let's get into Dan's segment with uh, how we can defend against West Ham and their Brexit ball. Right. Oh, what am I doing? What the hell am I doing here? Wait one second. So, first off. I've got some stats because uh, <laughs> it, would, it wouldn't be me without some stats. So, <clears throat> West Ham stats, these are all per 90, by the way. Uh, just, just a caveat. They rank 14th in the Premier League for non penalty expected goals created this season. Um, they are, however, they are joint fifth for non penalty expected goals per shot. So, Whilst they don't take that many shots, they rank 14th for the number of shots per game as well. They they tend to create better chances um, whilst having not as many shots, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, they rank 11th for completed crosses into the box. They rank eight, 18th for part, completed passes into the box. They rank 18th for... Um, uh, completed carries into the box. Huh. However, oh, they rank 18th for attacking third touches. So, yeah, so they have the, the third fewest touches per 90 in, in the opposition uh, attacking the attacking third. And they also have the 18th, they also rank 18th for attacking penalty touches uh, per 90 as well. So, Looking on that, I will be honest. Like it makes you wonder how they score, how they score goals. Um, they have so they have so few touches in 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 these areas. They take less than average shots, as in they take less than average number of shots. They don't c complete much into the box, so it does make you wonder how. Does that so mean they, they outscore their xG or? Uh, I think I think they have, yeah. I think they have, um, and I believe, and this is why Jared Bowen playing has really annoyed me because he's overscored his by loads this season. Like, I think he's overscored it by like five or six. And to be honest, in the whole West Ham team, off the top of my head, only one player has gone below two. I think, or like gone below like has gone below like one and a half. Most of them are around about zero or around or um yeah so they've they've done really well in terms of overscoring um so that's also another reason um however one thing i did find interesting was that they actually they got they ranked second for shot creating actions that are fouls so obviously that's i imagine jane wall prowse's expertise there uh, in combination with them being decent at set pieces anyway, because they've got physically quite a large team. Um, interestingly as well, they also rank third for shot creating actions from defensive actions. So 
I don't know. I guess sometimes they do manage to win win the ball a bit higher up, or maybe in the middle, or maybe it's even a case of like they win the ball and they're just so direct. Yeah, that they that they, you know, within two actions, they basically created a shot. Which, to yeah. be honest, based on what I'm gonna say, that doesn't surprise me. Yeah, I, I would I would have thought that because there has been many times where, for example, the, the defender makes a tackle. That's one. Mm. Pass it to War Prowls, that's two, and he launches it up top and then they'll shoot from that. So that 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 would be under three under three touches of the ball, let's say. Yeah, yeah, no def- Yeah, no, definitely. And yeah, and let me let me get the thing up. And then the way that they play, to be honest, that actually kind of makes sense. So first things first. Uh how how do they build up? So how let's say that they've got the ball. What do they do? So let's say the ball's here. Let's say Fabianski's taking a goal kick to Mavapaus. How how will they look? So let me just get our players in a reasonable position. Because we actually do press now, which is a shock. <laughs> I'm not used to this. Pressing? What's pressing? I, oh, I thought pressing was when I ironed my trousers. Um, <laughs> so... Generally, what happens is they'll have the ball. Uh, as JC said, Kufal likes to push up. The left back, it depends. Uh, but in the games I saw, they they the left back also pushes up. <coughs> what tends to happen is that they do form like a back three. And generally, either Alvarez will drop back. Actually, I think they normally play the other way around. Warprows will drop back into that three. Or... Sometimes even Alvarez, it will kind of look like this, and it will look like this, pretty much in in the build up, regardless of kind of where on the pitch. Here it is. So that's basically what they'll do uh, in terms of like a layout. Now, um, what this means is that they're able to, you know, they're able to play very wide with their with their fullbacks. And I think what they then do as well is that they like to use Kudus and Bowen to kind of aid the aid the fullbacks in, in this way, which will make more sense in a sec. So they are a very direct team. So from this kind of position, let's say, they will go very quickly from here to here. Now, how they do that, to be fair... It was more ver- when when I watched it, it was more varied than what I originally anticipated, because certainly when we did tactical last uh, last time for the reverse fixture, it was pretty much the ball long, and Bowen, who is an excellent excellent player at running in behind, it'll either be Bowen or Antonio pulling wide, and also now they've got Kudus as well. Um, those three players are very good at winning the ball in those in those kind of situations, chasing it down, running the channels, so on and so forth. But to be fair, they don't just do that. Um, they do like to do, from what I see now, one a lot of one-two passes to try and to try and again in a very di- man- direct manner to go from here to here. And then effectively, Antonio will then, or whoever the strikers will act as kind of like a pivot, not too dissimilar to how we try to use Mateta under Glasner. So, so they'll very quickly, let's say, again, will pass to Wall Prowse, Wall Prowse will pass to Paqueta, um, and then they'll either do like a one two kind of situation, or they'll pass it to Antonio, who will then look to lay it off to either Bowen or Kudus or someone like that. And again, Kudus and Bowen, when they receive the ball, they're both very good at carrying the ball. So that's something to to keep an eye out. Um, Now, okay, let's say what what if, uh, and we probably will do this, we'll make it very difficult to play through the middle because we'll have our, let's say we'll have our players like this. We'll have these two more here in the centre. We'll basically have a four, five, four, one, um, and it'll be very difficult for, let's say, let's say J- James Ward-Prowse has got the ball here. It'll be very difficult for him to play 
through these lines because, you know, if he plays the Bowen, four players around him, plays for Antonio, lots of players around him, could do same thing. Okay, you got Paqueta, but, um, you know, by the time they pass it, say say if you pass it here, by the time he's done that, you know, we've set ourselves and we've shut off those passing lanes again and maybe, maybe Mateta's moved in the middle to cut off this half of the pitch. Um, or, and this is something that uh, I forgot to mention with the stats, they actually have the most uh, switches per 90 of any team in the league, which means that they like to, you know, similar to like what um, Anderson did to Mitchell uh, the other day, pass it from one side of the pitch to the other. Um, and this is where their second string to their bow kind of comes in, their second they, they are very good, actually, I think, at building on the wings. Um, and it kind of links to what I said about them trying to do like one, two passes quite a lot. So let's say, I don't know, Pakitar's here and Kudus is here. What they will do is that they will help on, they will use their players to try and help on the wing if they can't go through the middle. So let's say um, Pakitar's won the ball, uh, has got the ball. Um, what they'll try, what he'll do is that uh, let's say he'll pass the ball to Emerson rather than just standing there or moving into the middle, he will actually make that run uh, onto the wing to try and to try and get that overload to try and get it so then they can engineer a situation where it looks more, you know, something like this and they've got an opportunity to cross the ball into the box. Weirdly, they didn't actually rank that high in terms of number of crosses per night knee, which I found a bit odd. But that's what they'll that's what they'll try to do. They use a lot of one two passes to build on the wing. It said if they can't go through the middle, which I think we're gonna make it very difficult for them to go through the middle. So I think they'll they will use their fullbacks as much as they can to try and get in behind us. Uh, my my personal worry is this right hand side again. Um, <clears throat> like I do think, don't get me wrong, Bowen's a brilliant player, and I think Kufal's a, a very good going forwards. But I think Mitchell and Lerma will have a much bigger hold of them than Kudus, Emerson, and Paqueta, who will who will drift to this left hand side. That's my that's kind of my worry uh, for us. And also, I do think <clears throat> at times we are a bit dodgy defending aerial situations so that would be my kind of worry there i think also with the pace that they've got up front uh, granted i think lerma can hack the pace maybe also climb but anderson who's in the middle of the center back trio yeah you know a, a good ball over the top antonio would just run away from anderson yeah no de de definitely um uh yeah i mean i think that'll be a good physical battle but like you say i think antonio's probably got the edge over him in terms yeah. of pace if it turns so, into a um, running race there's no 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 yeah no, no competition and this is where i guess like you get the trade-off of nathaniel klein at the moment versus joel ward like, obviously nathaniel klein's quicker but i think joel ward is better in the air so i would maybe say that um because ultimately what they want is that they want this space in behind to run into. That's what they want. Or they want this space over here, over here. So I actually think that we should just try to sit a little bit deeper. Um, obviously not as deep as we did against Liverpool, but I think we should we should sit a bit deeper. And like JC said, maybe leave someone like Eze out there so then we've got all this space for them to run into. I mean, going back to what JC said, these centre backs aren't the quickest in the world. Kufal's not the quickest in the world. We Wall Prowse isn't quick. The only quick players in their team are all their forward players, pretty much, and, and maybe Emerson. But um, <clears throat> so with that in mind, I think we should kind of just sit a little bit deeper, maybe like in like a mid to low block in this kind of area. Try to ensure that any ball that comes over here, either we're able to recover on the wing, or um or is something that Hen henderson can just make sure he runs out as quickly as he can to try and to try and grab and then 
then that leaves us then the opportunity, like JC said, to leave a player out like Eze, or if it's the other side, maybe um, maybe Michael Elise, and uh, and then hit them kind of in that transitional sort of phase. I'm not suggesting that we sit in a low block. I, I don't think we should do that, but I think that's a way just to limit their um, <clears throat> limit their attack. And ultimately, if we do pack this middle out. As long as they're not playing quickly, which let's be honest, they're playing after having played in Europe. They probably are going to be be a little bit jaded, you know. If it means that we shut off these areas and then let's say Kufal's got the ball and then has to go back to Mavropanos, and then we can slowly push out and do an intelligent press to maybe force them into into a long ball that they didn't maybe want to, or a difficult long ball that Henderson can gather. Then I think that that will serve us well. And obviously, with that in mind, we need to make sure. Uh, I know he hasn't scored. I don't know if he scored a free kick this season, but we need to make sure that we know that Ward Prowse is a very good free kick taker. We need to try and avoid free kicks in these kind of areas. And to be honest, that's that's all I would say. The only thing I would like to um, end on, and this isn't a jinx because. Um, because I didn't, I didn't jinx the uh, Liverpool game. So, yeah, I think, I think it's worth noting that West Ham have had nine games. The nine games they've had this season after a European game, they've only won twice. So, and they weren't, and all of them, all of their, I would say they had, they've like, it's a real mixed bag of the teams that they've played. Like they've played, they drew against Burnley for one. They lost to Everton. They've. Um, I think they beat who they beat. They beat Forest and Wolves. So they were. All I'm saying is that that is a sign that they're obviously not at their best after a European game. Whether they beat us or not, that's not really relevant. It's more to do with they're gonna they're gonna be tired regardless of their of the, whoever they play. I think they're gonna be tired, and I think they are probably gonna be a bit slow. And for that and again, reason, though, looking at that, they did get a good draw against Villa away from home as well. I oh, know at home. After a European game, yeah, but my point is, is that yeah, but they also drew to Burnley, so yeah, like true. so, um, you know, I've and also they lost to Everton. I mean, admittedly, Everton playing well at the time, but my point is, is that they're going to be. I think they're going to be a bit, bit, bit tired. Like I'm, I'd much rather play them this weekend than say the following weekend where they don't have a European game, and I think. If we can sit in that kind of position where they need to be a bit quick to break us down, but because they're a bit tired, they can't really play that quick. And also, if we just don't give them that space in behind, or if we do, then we just ensure that we cover it very well, then I think they're going to find problems with breaking us down and and, and getting shots off. And like well, I playing, said... Playing devil's, devil's advocate a little bit to that, because I agree with what you're saying... But do they have enough squad depth to almost rejuvenate the side by, like, by replacing like a good chunk of their first of that starting eleven? Um. Well, I think the only, to be honest, I think the only real place that they have a lot of depth is the midfield. Because I mean, look at the forwards. Who who would they re- like? Who yeah, would they true. rotate out? Yeah, I, I agree with the forward line, but I'm thinking more of like the defence and the midfield, because they've got a few extra centre-backs, let's say they've got two left-backs. Uh, mm. Ariola will be back as well. So then they've got two goalkeepers again. Um, I'm not sure, because I think, I think, I think they will still be, I think they will still be tired. And I think, I think they record after European games, I think does demonstrate that. Um, yeah, they can swap players out, but then you know if they're swapping out Ward Prowse and Alvarez for Suchek and uh, Phillips, down. like they're they're yeah. they're te- do you know what I mean? Like they're they're worse players. So you know, I think I think there's a trade off in terms of the quality that they would be able to play and whether they're fresh or not. And also, I mean, Phillips Phillips I think's got a great range of passing, but he's not the quickest passer in the world, and neither Suchek. So if they're both going to play, um. If they're, if they're if they're gonna be I'd rather play against them two, to be honest, than than a, a, a tired Ward Prowse and um 
and Alvarez. Yeah, I agree. Um, so, yeah, I think uh, next up is score predictions. So before we went live, I jumped into the YouTube studio and I put a little poll in the chat for everyone. So I said, what will the final result be? Will it be a Palace win, a West Ham win, or will it be a draw? Jeez. And looking at the statistics, uh, 5% said a West Ham win, which is not a lot. 14% said a draw, and 81% said Palace are going to win it. So, with Palace going to win it, let's do our score predictions. So, guys, please put your score predictions in the chat. I believe that Dan threw me under the bus last week, so <laughs> I will return the favour, my friend. Um, I agree. I don't think we. I agree with the comments. I don't think we're going to keep a clean sheet. Um. Is I want to say 3 1, but Ritual has already gone for that, so I'm going to say 2 1 Palace. Boo, I was going to say 2 1 as well. <laughs> the reason why I say 2 1 is it's always a close game at Solast, yeah. And actually, that's all I was that's a thing I forgot to mention. We, we, the record is the record against West Ham isn't too isn't too bad. Like, we beat them last time they played at our place 4 3. I like, I feel like I don't really have much recollection of that game. Um, I just and then, check scored, and then obviously um, you had that time when uh, Mikel Antonio got got the assist for one of our goals. Yeah, that's still that's still the best TikTok that we've done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know what? Yeah, it's funny. I think um, I, th- I think I think I think Chairman said it to me. I think he said that um, that Mikel Antonio has got more league assists for Crystal Palace than Max Meyer has. <laughs> I mean, that sounds... That's a, did Max Meyer even get an assist for us? I don't know. I know he scored a goal against Liverpool, but I don't think he's done anything else. Max Meyer. Where is he now? Let's have a look. I know this is totally irrelevant, but I'm curious now. Earth says 3-0 Palace. Uh, Animal says 2-1 Palace. Spritch says 4-0 Palace clean sheet. Uh, well, he's in the Swiss League and he seems to be doing all right there, to be fair. So fair, fair play, play to him. He's found his level. <laughs> fair play, cuss. <laughs> uh, Mitch says, uh, only thing I remember about that last game of the season was the game, about the game last season was Zuma getting injured and all of us singing. That's how your cat feels. <laughs> yeah, no. Oh, yeah, no, I do. I, uh, that's jogged my memory, actually. That was definitely worth the price, Mitch. 100%. Um, so this week, we're not going to do a preview tomorrow. We're going to do it on Friday because then we can look at how their second leg against Leverkusen goes so we can have a little bit more I guess a little bit more in-depth view of how they might actually play against us because then we'll see who starts you know we might see who they're going to rest if anyone gets injured for example so hopefully we can get a little bit better content out there for you guys uh the game is on it's a Sunday three o'clock kickoff isn't it it's a really weird one yeah Sunday three o'clock um yeah, so game on Sunday, fan cams out Sunday evening. Yeah, uh, I guess Monday review. And then, yeah, I think Monday review. And then, oh, how's that going to work? Because we need to pre-record next week, don't we? Yeah, cause, and then the game's on Wednesday. Yeah, so we need to pre-record. i tell you what we could do if you're okay are you able to do the the review on monday um i'm working two to eight next week so if it's off like yeah if it's after i mean i should be home by like half eight i could pre-record with you at nine or something and then we can release it on tuesday yeah if that's right with you yeah cool uh a few more comments. Spiritual saying that's how your cat feels. Uh, too early for beach talk. I'm expecting five nil for us before the season ends. Uh, I'm going to call the scorers Kudus, Mateta, and Michael Elise. Jeez. 
guys, thank you very, very much for watching. Uh, this has been the Taxi Eagle for Crystal Palace versus West Ham at Sellers Park. And as always, up the palace. Up the palace. Eagles! Eagles. Eagles.